All right, well, let's jump into our old buddy Ryan Chapman on Ukraine. We've talked about Ryan Chapman before. He's um, fairly intellectually honest. Uh, his videos often give a good jumping off point to talk about our ideas. Um, in this video, he kind of feigns objectivity at first before just falling into propaganda talking points because that's easier than doing research, I guess. Um, so yeah. Oh, thank you very much, Samael. Nothing to say, just support. Wow. And two twenties in a row. That's huge. Thank you all so much. We're going to get Carlos a new mic and a new uh, camera ASAP. So thanks. So as I'm sure everyone's aware, Russia began its invasion of Ukraine. Just about everywhere I look, I see people condemning it. But it seems like most of that condemnation is instinctual, meaning that people wouldn't be able to articulate very clearly why they're condemning it. And also, when I look at Vladimir Putin, I see someone who believes that he's being distorted and misunderstood in the West. So given all that, I thought it would be a healthy intellectual exercise to take a sober look at Putin's justifications for the invasion, to see how well his arguments hold up as justifying his invasion of Ukraine. So that's what we're going to do in this video. So far, he's given his rationale in two main places. One was in an essay that was published in the summer of 2021, and the other was in a speech given on Monday, February 21st. The substance of the two are similar, and in sum, he makes three main points. Putin's first argument is that Ukraine is essentially a historical mistake. Putin begins that argument by talking about a historical commonality between Russians and Ukrainians. And I'll let Putin say it in his own words. If Ukraine is not just a neighbor, neighboring country to us, it is an inherent part of our own history, culture, spiritual space. They are our comrades, relatives, not only colleagues, friends, but also our family, people we have blood and family ties with. And he's even extended that to saying that Russians and Ukrainians were one people, a single whole. And then he continues to say that Ukraine being its own country with its own ethnic identity is a mistake. But it's not a Ukrainian mistake, it's a Russian mistake, specifically made by the Soviet Union. Now radicals and nationalists, including, and first of all, in Ukraine, they take the merit of winning independence. But we can see that that's not the truth. What happened to our country was caused by the mistake done by the leadership of the Communist Party, made at different stages and at different types in times in their national and economical policies. I think Putin seems hesitant to clearly state what he's getting at there. But I think it's clear enough. I think he's trying to insinuate that Ukrainian independence wasn't earned by Ukrainians, but instead it was granted by Russians. And Russia granting Ukraine its independence was a mistake. So therefore he's arguing that it should be Russia's prerogative to roll back that mistake and to take back Ukraine's independence. And that's kind of a critique of Lenin, basically saying that too much, you know, the, the principle of national sovereignty was sort of overdone. Um, and, you know, nations were created based on ethnic identities that they didn't need to be, which then allowed the U.S. to play a, or pray, uh, boost up nationalism, prey upon nationalism and nationalist sentiment in those areas to create uh, separatism and to create anti-Soviet forces. And as the article we published from Baxter Dimitrov showed, as well as a handful of other articles, um, the U.S. has been funding um, Ukrainian ethno-nationalists um, in Ukraine since way, way, way back, you know, uh, pre-World War II or right after World War II. Um, so they basically exploited nationalism. Um, so Putin's critique of Lenin is, you know, you shouldn't have created this distinct nation of Ukraine because that allowed um, the imperialists to prey upon that contradiction and um, create all these radically anti-Russian Ukrainian nationalists and chauvinists who are running the show in Ukraine with U.S. weapons in hand today. Yeah, I don't I don't agree with with uh, with Putin's critique um, and in part because, uh, you know, the creation of these nation states that were grounded on the principle of national self-determination were extremely successful. Um, and, you know, to blame Lenin for a nationalism that the Soviet government was able to temper uh, successfully to remove and to make into a progressive nationalism that's also internationalist. Um, to blame Lenin then for you know these phenomenons which have which were not only uh, funded by the West uh, from the beginning um, but have also intensified with the fall of the Soviet Union. I just, I think he is 
pointing at the wrong factor. There's a whole other factors that lead to the fact of the fascistic tendencies today with a whole lot more weight than the national self-determination policy and its application to Ukraine. I pulled up a blog on international history that fact-checked Putin's claim that Ukraine and Russia have this shared harmonious history. The long story short, is you have a shared history, but... Um, one of the things that, that we've done in terms of coverage of the proxy war against Russia has been done by, by one of our uh, contributors, video contributors, article contributors, brilliant uh, human being, uh, Kayla Popichet. And she's done a lot of these videos that debunks the nationalist myth about a specific line of Ukrainian history that's divorced from Russia. Um, and these myths are extremely ingrained in Ukrainian civil society. They're in the textbooks and they've been in the textbooks for the last like 30 uh, years since the fall of the Soviet Union. But they've also have very much shaped the uh, consciousness and national nationalism of the Ukrainian diaspora, specifically in New York. There's a whole uh, there's there's a big influence of Ukrainian uh, diasporic civil society influence that is shaped around these myths and, um, you know, they do anything from like soccer camps and, and these different activities that don't seem political, but they're within this context of creating a mythic past. Um, and that's very deeply ingrained in the fascist project, um, whether it's with Nazi Germany or with uh, Italy, it's creating these this mythic past um, that is deeply centered in elevating the nation to being superior to everyone else um, and in otherizing communities that your national past is historically blended with, like the Russian community. Mm -hmm. So um, in terms of saying that there's no distinct Ukrainian history that is easily separatable from Russian history, um, he's a Putin is actually absolutely correct about in, in that. For sure. And it's interesting to think about from a Marxist perspective with the conceptual device of base and superstructure with the education system and the culture of um, Ukrainian society kind of being a reflection of the base of society. Um, and the U.S. is, you know, come largely to control or via NGOs and other arms of influence, the education systems and the culture of Ukraine, like we said, pushing this ethno-nationalist anti-Russian ideology um, after World War II, but then especially after the fall of the Soviet Union. And if you watch uh, the Revolution Report, Donald Corder's uh, video analyzing um, Ukraine and the Russian special military operation, he shows that the education system is basically pushing ethno-nationalism on the kids. They have like uh, summer camps where kids go and learn about Stepan Bandera and the glory of Ukrainian history. So that's the, the U.S., the empire, the, the capitalists controlling the superstructure of Ukraine to infuse um, their society with this um, you know, anti-Russian sentiment uh, and Ukrainian nationalism which in 2014 they were able to stoke and rile up and and bring to bring that antagonism to a head which, which created the coup but they're also somewhat separate and their history is also marked with conflict separatism and tragedy and they concluded by saying that a glance into ukrainian history reveals that putin's claims are based on a dangerously distorted reading of the past but none of that's important the only important thing here is that in 1991 ukraine became independent they had their own independence movement with their own declaration of independence supported by the overwhelming majority of Ukrainian people, which was recognized as legitimate by countries around the world, including Russia. So Ukraine is its own country with its own identity. And Russia saying that allowing that was a mistake isn't relevant. Once a country becomes a sovereign country, that's it. Another country deciding later that it was a mistake to allow it doesn't change it. Putin's second argument frames Ukraine as an aggressor. To understand this argument, you have to understand a little bit about what's going on in Ukraine. Ukraine's been divided in a conflict roughly between Western Ukraine and Eastern Ukraine. Western Ukraine is more sympathetic with the West and with the Ukrainian identity. And Eastern Ukraine is more sympathetic to Russia, Russian identity, and Russian separatism. So there's been sort of a messy civil war going on between those two sides, especially since 2014. Russian separatism? I don't know if that's a fair way to characterize the people of Donetsk and Lugansk who don't want to have their homes blown up anymore, the Crimean people. I mean, maybe. I, it is they want to leave Ukraine and ultimately, you know, 
become part of Russia. They're not going to remain independent republics, but. Um, I, I don't think it's fair to just characterize them as Russian separatists. That's how the Western media has characterized the people fighting for their homeland in the Donbass region. Right. And I wonder, I mean, maybe I'm just reading too much into it, but uh, that sort of language, I, I feel like being in a country that um, has had a civil war that uh, most people have an extremely abstract understanding of, that separatist language, um, I don't know if it gets at people's consciousness in, in, in ways that make them think about, oh, the people that separate from the union, they bad. Um, and it, it loses sight of the reason why uh, these people no longer wanted to be a part of Ukraine. It's because Ukraine was a or is a fascist state that banned their language, banned their political parties, uh, imprisoned uh, people, shelled people, killed 14,000 of them, um, and has, you know, been, in terms of classification, you can't classify it as anything else but fascistic. Um, and uh, fascistic with the specific other being, uh, the, the figure of the other being the, the Russian uh, Slavic population uh, in eastern Ukraine. So um, naturally, um, you don't want to be a part of a state that's uh, waging um, basically a genocide against your people. As Putin frames it, Western Ukraine and the Ukrainian government are the aggressors in this conflict, and Eastern Ukraine and Russian separatists are the victims. I think this part of Putin's speech hasn't been given very much play in the West, so I'm going to play it somewhat at length here. Population all the... None of Putin's speech has gotten much play in the West. This is why Ryan Chapman is honestly better than a lot of Western reporters, because they'll actually show you what Putin said. Crimea Peninsula made their choice to be with Russia. Ukrainian authorities have nothing to say against this. That's why they place their bets on aggression. They use sounds of extremists, including the radical Islamic organizations. They are sending saboteurs to destroy vital infrastructure. They kidnap citizens of Russia. We have proof, we have evidence that such aggressive activities is perpetrated with the support of foreign special services. In March of 2021, Ukraine adopted new military strategy. This document almost completely aimed at confrontation with Russia. They want to drag foreign states into the conflict with our country. He also talked about arson in Odessa that killed Russian separatists and went unpunished by Ukrainian authorities and went so far to call it a genocide that wasn't being recognized by the West. Now, almost every day, they are shelling settlements in Donbass. They have amassed large troops. They're... So uh, what, it's not just the attack on the trade union in Odessa that he called a genocide. It's the repeated shelling of homes in the Donbass by the Ukrainian military being armed to the teeth by the U.S. Um, for, for what, eight years, you know, or seven and a half years before Russia actually got involved, combined with the burning alive of trade unionists in Odessa and the um, sniper fire in Maidan Square targeting anti-Maidan protesters. So it's not just that one horrific event that does show, you know, the nature of the U.S.-backed Ukrainian government, that trade union house burning in Odessa, but it's the, the collection of things done by this literal ethno-nationalist U.S.-backed Nazi puppet government um, over the years against the Russian citizens, including, you know, he doesn't even mention the banning of the Russian language, you know, mm -hmm. and that, and that um, holding up of Stepan Bandera as a national hero. Uh, like these are absolutely, you know, steps towards genocide. Oh, yeah. And just the general atmosphere of dehumanization, which is the dehumanization of the Russian people that we've seen over the last three years since the beginning of the special military operations. I would say even since a little bit before that has been horrendous. Absolutely horrendous. The most obscene dehumanization of a people that we've seen. And in, in I mean, you, you saw it against uh, Muslim people with the war on terror. And now you're seeing similar forms of hatred against the Russian people. And it's absolutely disgusting. It's disgusting. And it's a, it's an embryonic form of what you find in a more intensified form within the Ukro Nazis that have been waging this exterminationist warfare against the Russian people in the Donbass region. So there's no other way to ca categorize that other than genocide. It's been a, a an attack an attempted genocide against these people that have been asking for eight years for Russian interference to help them stop dying. Um, and the most progressive forces in the region, the communist parties, 
of, of Ukraine, Donetsk, Lugansk, and the Communist Party of the Russian Federation have been asking for the uh, intervening of Russia so that this senseless killing that's led by Nazis would stop. And it took eight years and attempted peace treaties. And now we know that we're not actual uh, attempts of peace, but just buying time so that NATO and the, and the West and the U.S. could build up the capabilities of Ukraine to wage this proxy war against Russia. Um, it's, it's, Putin and, and, and United Russia have added, acted in an extremely sensible manner with regards to this issue, perhaps uh, too sensible and too passive. That's the criticism that the CPRF, the Communist Party of the Russian Federation, has in terms of Putin's uh, dealing with this issue. He took too long and 14,000 lives uh, were lost that uh, those deaths could have been uh, prevented. But, I mean, it's, you know, there's something that Lavrov says in a speech, I believe it's to the United Nations, um, where one of the uh, spokes uh, people had said that they couldn't sleep over the deaths that were taking place in Ukraine. And he said, I mean, just imagine that those deaths are in, in Iraq and Afghanistan and Libya and Palestine and that uh, this demonic figure that you're painting as Russia, imagine that it's uh, the U.S. and, and, and Israel, um, and nothing, w- you'd be able to sleep just fine because they've been ignoring, you know, the, the senseless deaths that have, been, uh, that, that have been carried out by U.S. imperialism. The study just came out, I think, what was it, Eddie, 3.5 million deaths? Ever since the invasion of Iraq, or, or 4 million, 4.5 million? 4.5 million. 4.5 million senseless deaths. The majority of them have been civilian. Study after study shows that close to 90, 95% of these deaths are civilian deaths. Um, so, I mean, what are we doing here, guys? Um, why do some lives matter and others don't? Yeah, and if we wanted to use the same rhetorical tactics that the liberals do, we call them genocide deniers. Oh, you don't think that these fascist forces were, you know, who are targeting and killing Russian people were doing a genocide? Genocide denier, genocide denier, genocide deniers say it over and over and over again until people believe it's true. That's the liberal strategy, except they're full of shit. Using offensive and mental vehicles and other heavy machinery, torturing people, children, women, elderly people. It doesn't stop. It doesn't cease. We see no end to it. And the so-called civilized world and our western colleagues proclaim themselves as the only representatives of this free world they prefer not to notice this as if there is nothing like this happening there is no genocide perpetuated against 14 million people from what i can tell this is a very one-sided depiction of the conflict that's mixing truth with gross exaggeration so for example there was arson in odessa and it does seem like there was negligence by the authorities there but it's worth saying that in these messy conflicts one side can always name grievances against the other i'm not going to try dude fuck off you scrawny little punk. Sorry, I said I was gonna remain objective. Fuck off with that. It was the it was the Nazis killing the trade unionists, just like it always is when a Nazi fascist government takes power. The first people they go for is the communists and the trade unionists, and they kill them, they murder them in the streets, or they burn them alive in a trade union building. And then these liberals come out and go, "Oh well, who's to say which side is to blame?" Who's to say which side we can blame in this clash between two political groups? The Nazis. We can blame the Nazis, not the trade unionists, not the communists who are fighting for peace in their country. The U.S. backed and armed fascists who burned people alive in the trade union building are the ones who we blame for that, Ryan. It was not a clash. It was a massacre. Um, And it was a massacre sponsored by the U.S., which is another error I have flawed in his argument. He's saying that Putin is claiming that Ukraine was attacking. Ukraine was the aggressor. Not really. He's saying that Ukraine is a puppet state of NATO and the U.S., and they are the aggressors. You know, uh, Russia is much larger than Ukraine. If Ukraine wasn't being supplied arms and javelin missiles um, from the U.S., the war would have been over a long time ago. It's ultimately a war between NATO and Russia that NATO has done everything they can to provoke with things like the Odessa massacre. But if you just distort those events and pretend like they were just clashes between both sides and not events that were carefully orchestrated by the, you know, hundreds of U.S. NGOs in Ukraine funneling money and political support into certain groups, um, then you can make it look like it's a, you know, like 
the U.S. and NATO aren't the aggressors in this situation. Kind of, um, but they absolutely were. And the Odessa massacre is a perfect example of that. They get to the bottom of that conflict. The reason why Putin brought it up was partly to justify his invasion of Ukraine, to protect Russian separatists from the quote-unquote aggression of the Ukrainian government. I think the only world where the argument works is if there's actually a genocide happening against Russian separatists. But I don't think the evidence is there to support that. And you have to remember that the burden of proof is on Putin. If he's the one claiming that there's a genocide happening, then it's up to him to provide evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that it is. But I think it would be putting it mildly to say that that evidence so far hasn't been provided. So even Putting it, I mean, you have deaths, reported deaths that are reported by international organizations. You have Nazis. Reported Nazis, not just by, you know, the, the neutral and pro-Russia forces, but by the West itself that has been reporting this since 2014, 2015 and before. You know, all the newspapers that call you a Putinist conspiracy theorist for talking about the Nazis in Ukraine, we're talking about them in the same way about Ukraine's Nazi or fascism problem in 2014 and 2015. So we're... we're <laughs> You know, it, it's not coming out of nowhere. It's If you look at it comprehensively, you've seen how the rhetoric has changed. And what are they going to say? Like, oh, these are reformed Nazis. Now the swastika means that they're Buddhists. And the skulls, it means that they're fans of Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> what the fuck are we doing here? Like, what more proof do you want? You have the Nazis. You have the dead people. You have the connection of the Nazis killing the people that are then dead. What more evidence do you want? That's like David Hume, where he's, he, you know, I can't see necessary connection. I can't see necessary connection. You know, a necessary connection is just a projection. You see it right there. You are yourself the one that's making the abstraction to disconnect the things. I'm sorry for <laughs> making this stupid analogy that only made me. Uh, philosophy. That's all right. Well, there, I'm sure there's at least three philosophy professors in the audience tonight who really. Like, oh yeah, that yeah, one. that's right. Yeah, it's true. And I'd also love to see the same energy for Adrian Zenz. Why is the burden of proof on Putin, but not on Adrian Zenz when it comes to Xinjiang, China? But that's it. That's what the the liberals do. You know, anytime a U.S. backed group is doing a genocide, oh, we can't be sure. The burden of proof is on you. But as soon as we you express an ounce of skepticism about the claims of the U.S. State Department in Xinjiang, China. You're a genocide denier. How could you ignore the suffering of the people in China being genocided? Well, how could you ignore the suffering of the Russian people? Well, that's not really a genocide. There's only 14,000 people who had their homes blown up. Uh, the five heads makes it good that before, the 2020, before 2022, the West provided the evidence. Um, yeah. Ukraine is the aggressor in that conflict. It still doesn't justify Russia's invasion of Ukraine. One country can't justify the invasion of another just because they believe a government is being aggressive in a civil conflict. Putin's third argument is that Russia is threatened and has a right to react. This argument centers around NATO and is about NATO's expansion towards Russian borders. Putin argues that if Ukraine were to join NATO and if it were equipped with modern missile technology, it would then pause that. Sorry. To Russian security. The Minsk agreements hasn't been brought up. Russia did not want to go in. Russia spent eight years trying to look for every possible wish way to not go in. It had been begged by this region to go in for eight years. It had been begged by the most progressive forces in the whole region and in Russia to go in, and it didn't go in. It tried to negotiate with the West, and the West doing what the West does best, you know, fake the whole negotiations. It pretended to be for peace. It pretended to be uh, uh, that the Minsk Accords were an honest attempt at peace. And in reality, it was just buying up time to arm Ukraine to be as successful as they've been in this very unsuccessful proxy war against Russia. So it's, a, you know, there's so many factors that are left out in his depiction and this narrative. And, that's really the, the heart of propaganda. It's not just the fact that they take small facts and they twist it and they, they spin a narrative, but it's what is left out. What is left out is often the most important part in the discourse. And what's been left out has been the essence of this whole conflict. The fact that the West promised as soon as the Soviet Union collapsed that it would not move one inch 
one inch east. Maybe he mentions that now. Now he's turning to the national security concerns. So, you know, ignore it if he mentions it. But there's so much that's being left out. Absolutely. And especially, like you said, the Minsk agreements, which is something that people will call a conspiracy theory. You know, if you say that Ukraine was going to attack Russia once they joined NATO, when Angela Merkel... Mem uh, leader of NATO member country Germany literally admitted that she admitted it. NATO is telling you, you know, that we were just planning to attack Russia after we built up arms. That's all Minsk was. And then MSNBC hosts will be like, no, 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 that's a conspiracy theory. They're literally saying it themselves. And then, you know, Ryan Chapman, who I expect him to be smarter than an MSNBC host, he probably knows this um, and is just choosing to omit it. Um, but he's trying to make it sound like Russia shouldn't have felt provoked or they shouldn't have felt attacked. They were absolutely being attacked. And, and as I said, what more proof do you need than the NATO leaders admitting, yeah, we were just building up arms to attack Russia. And Russia these... for years was saying, sorry, last thing, Russia for years was saying Na or adding Ukraine to NATO is a red line. If you add Ukraine to NATO, we are going to do something about it. And what did the U.S. do? They continued training up Ukraine's troops to make them NATO interoperable, make them so they could fight a war alongside NATO troops from France, Germany, whoever else, um, building up arms to, to attack and threaten Russia. And then, you know, continuing to float the idea of NATO membership for Ukraine. They were absolutely provoked. And, and Chapman is acting like if it's just a random neighboring country that is killing its own people, and Russia shouldn't step in because those are the affairs, the civil affairs of this country. I mean, for fuck's sake, a lot of these people are Russian citizens. A lot of these people are Russian citizens. The example that you always bring up. If you had a situation in Mexico where there's one region of Mexico that's heavily populated by American citizens, and then they have their language eight years ago banned, they have, you know, the leaders that massacred Americans uh, 80 years ago propped up as, you know, the heroes of the state. If you have Nazis bombing this region and killing up to 14,000 of the American citizens in this region, and if you have then Russia funding, be the, the force that's funding all the Nazis killing America, what the hell do you think America would have done from the first or, or, or second, from the first 10 deaths, it would have intervened. You know, so the fact that Russia waited eight years, it waited eight years, 14,000 deaths is extremely sensible because it knows the, 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 the effects and we've seen them, the effects that could come about through intervening. For fuck's sake, a missile just hit uh, the Russian building. I don't remember what the, the building is called, but where Putin is at. Do you remember what the building is called? We covered it a, a few streams ago. The, the presidential palace. Oh, yeah. Well, it's, it's a missile that hit one of the key government buildings. Like, the West has been provoking this affair in such a way that's leading humanity to a very, very scary place. I think it was the Kremlin, Carlos. Yeah. In his words. And uh, travel time of the Tomahawk missiles to Moscow will be less than 35 minutes. Ballistic missiles, 7-8 minutes. And the uh, hypersound offensive weapons, 4-5 minutes. That's like having a knife against our throat. And he even cites international law to say that one country can't enhance its own security at the cost of the security of another country. In international law, it says the principle, there is a principle of indivisible security, which states that one country cannot enhance its security at the expense of security of others. And then specifies that talking about Ukraine. And if Ukraine was to join NATO, it would serve as a direct threat to the security of Russia. He said, I, is he saying that... He might be saying Ukraine should can't increase their security at the expense of Russia, but he could be referencing the, the West there, too. You know, that they can't increase their security by controlling Ukraine at the expense of Russia, who's now going to be threatened. Says he's been voicing these grievances to the West, but the West hasn't been taking him seriously. They've been carrying on and treating him like a dog barking at a caravan. Ignoring True. our purpose and our warnings, they just didn't care about that. They did whatever they deemed necessary and appropriate. And I believe they plan to continue doing like that because they see us as a dog barking at a caravan. He says that since his warnings have been ignored, he has a right to act to protect his own security and that he plans on doing it. About principled matters, had no response from the U.S. and NATO when the level of threat for our country is becoming greater and greater. Russia has every right to take countermeasures to enhance our own security. And that's how we plan to act. 
So Putin feels threatened by NATO, and if Ukraine joined NATO, then that would raise that threat to an existential threat. And so far, Putin's warnings and grievances about it have been ignored. In my opinion, this is Putin's real justification for the invasion. If you can imagine Putin in, say, a courtroom having to defend his actions, I think this is the line that he would probably take to defend himself. So I think this third argument is the real one. And I think the other two arguments are mainly designed to garner support from people who are already sympathetic to Russia. But however good of an argument that might be, and however good of a geopolitical critique that might be, does it follow that it justifies Russia's invasion of Ukraine? And the only world where I could see the answer to that being yes would be if all other diplomatic solutions failed. Russia did make diplomatic gestures, but they claim that those gestures failed because the world wasn't taking them seriously. However, how is that not true, dude? America's intellectuals are as belligerent and stupid as the country that they live in and the, the leaders that run our country. You're ignoring all of his main points. You're ignoring all of the main points that show that Ukraine was the aggressors and that they their government was run by a horde of U.S.-backed Nazis. Um, you're ignoring the fact that Putin consistently said NATO membership was a red line, yet the U.S. continued to train up NATO interoperable troops right on Russia's border, which he didn't bring up at all. He just completely ignored that fact. Like There are material things that the U.S. was doing to increase hostility with Russia time and time again, building up arms to eventually attack them, as Angela Merkel admitted, while Russia was repeatedly saying, no, don't do this or we're going to invade. Don't do this or we're going to invade. Don't do this or we're going to invade. This is a red line. But Chapman ignores all that to, to make it seem like Russia's belligerent. He says, you know, I can't imagine a, a world where that would be justified. Well, you, you can't imagine the real world because you haven't brought up any of the real facts that led to this. Um, I had something else I was going to say, but I lost it. True, that might be. I was, uh, I was looking for a video, but I couldn't find it. But there's this old video of uh, Biden ad admitting this, that uh, we cannot keep uh, moving NATO east because it's going to provoke a war with, with Russia. It's been a concern that you know foreign policy uh, strategists in the U.S. have had for a very long time because it's very clear to anyone with two fingers in front of them, the actual threat that that uh, presents to the Russian state and the Russian people. Yes. And you should, yeah, and you know that, Ryan Chapman. You know that. I know you're smarter than that. You know that NATO was created to contain the Soviet Union. It was never supposed to expand. You know that U.S. foreign policy makers know that they're going to push us towards World War III by moving NATO east. You know that, and you're choosing to ignore it so you can feed the U.S. State Department narrative. And it's and, intellectual cowardice. And the Russian people still remember from 30 years ago what living under a puppet state of the West was like. There was no devastation to a state that has occurred like that, which happened to 90s Russia after the overthrow of the Soviet Union and when the puppet, the Western puppet of Yeltsin was was in power, complete destruction of the Russian people's life security, life expectancy, um, you know, just security in general, because these mafias pop up in these oligarchs and the country gets destroyed, destroyed. Historians and have pillaged. called it the first. Yeah, and pillaged. Historians have called it the first case of demodernization. It, it, so the Russian people remember that very well. So it's 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 not just a, a threat to like the state and Putin or whatever. It's a threat to the Russian people because they know very well what it means to be a puppet of the West that can be freely looted and that uh, can give its people nothing but austerity and and degrad regulation for it, for foreign companies to to exploit Russian resources and super exploit its people. And the reason, the whole reason the U.S. is increasing hostility with Russia is because they're not able to pillage their resources anymore. Russia has rebuilt themselves and they're still capitalists, yes, but Putin has told the oligarchs you can't just do whatever you want to maximize profit by selling resources wherever. You have to invest in Russia. You have to invest in Russian infrastructure and Russian gas, which then they're trading with the Europeans. Uh, so the U.S. blew up Nord Stream. That's what all of this is about. They don't want Russia to assert themselves as a power meaning they don't want Russia to feed their people and put their people in homes and have infrastructure and, you know, development. The U.S. wants to just pillage their resources and treat them like a colony, um, which is what's led us to this conflict. And Russia is saying, no, they're standing up to the Western bullies. Through in the day or two before the invasion, the day or two before the invasion, the entire world was paying attention to them. 
and leaders around the world begged him to negotiate. Putin successfully brought attention to himself and successfully brought a level of seriousness to Russian demands. It seems like the opportunity for diplomacy was there, and it seems like Russia didn't take it. And instead, they invaded. Shut up, dude. Shut. You're so... Bring up the Minsk agreements. The opportunity for diplomacy was there. The freaking leader of Germany said that the peace plan that Russia was pushing for, that Russia was begging for, was just a way for the U.S. to stall and build up arms so they could attack Russia. How could you ignore that point unless you are a liar, unless you are extremely ignorant and drunk on MSNBC, or you're just a straight-up liar? Like, I don't know how else to, to work around it, where you say that Russia, you know, refused diplomacy. They asked, they begged for diplomacy, dude. The people of the Donbass asked them to intervene 10 times, and Russia said, no, we're looking for diplomatic solutions. Pull your head out of your ass or out of the NGOs that fund you. It, th this is why it's, it's the best form of propaganda. I don't know how many views it has, but I know that uh, the effect that it has, that, that it can have, that this narrative can have is much more successful than the, the one that's usually spent by mainstream media. Um, and that's what's scary about this. It's really, really good crafted propaganda. Um, it brings up the Putin speech and it selectively uh, leaves stuff in and then leaves stuff out. And it's very selective and it, it presents objectivity. And in doing that, it is the most successful at removing the conditions for the possibility of an actual objective assessment. Absolutely. That's exactly what it is. So however real Russia's grievances may be about NATO, if all that's true, then it can't be said that the invasion is justified. When we're talking about the invasion of Ukraine, we're talking about a country's sovereign rights, people's rights to their own freedom, their own government, their own way of living, which is not even to mention the cost of human life or the damage it does to a country. So invading a country is a very serious thing to do, and you need a very good reason to do it. As far as I can tell, none of these reasons get us there. That's probably a conclusion that most people watching this already agree with, but hopefully hearing that hashed out. Where's your criticism, Foo Fighter Man, Skinny Dave Grohl? Where's your criticism of the U.S.'s attempt to invade Russia? Where's your criticism of the 2014 coup? You're so concerned about sovereignty and, you know, you say it, invasion can never be justified. Well, Angela Merkel admitted that they were going to invade Russia. Where's your concern about that? The U.S., and their NGO is overthrew the Ukrainian government in 2014, but you don't care about that. Why? It doesn't fit your narrative. You know, and notice how when we had disagreements with Putin and with Russia, we were honest about them, right? Because we're not here to sell you a narrative. We're here to tell you the truth. And the truth is that NATO provoked this conflict and NATO is pushing us towards World War III and NATO put a fascist government in power of Ukraine so that they could continue hostilities with Russia. It doesn't mean we love Russia. It doesn't mean we're going to support everything Putin does or gold stamp everything Putin does, but we don't have to lie to push our narrative. If we were in Russia, we'd be much more critical of, of Putin on an everyday basis. We'd be criticizing yeah. his national policy. We'd be showing how he doesn't fully represent the interests of, uh, of Russian working people. We'd be doing what the Communist Party of the Russian Federation does, um, and, and that's probably the, the party that we would be in. So, you know, to, to, to call us Putinists is just completely absurd. Um, and if we had a critique uh, within the Russian context, and it was our people that uh, were getting massacred for eight years straight, we would be mad, as a lot of the communists are in that region, at how long it's taken Putin to do something. Um, now, of course, the deaths that have been, uh, you know, that have occurred uh, after the intervention have been, you know, very, very much great. And perhaps uh, Putin was, was wise in waiting or perhaps he wasn't. I mean, I don't know. But when your people are being massacred and you wait eight years, that's not something to applaud. Um, 